Professor Rex Jung is an assistant professor of neurosurgery at the University of New Mexico and a clinical neuropsychologist <laughs> in private practice. He has contributed to over 100 research articles across a wide, wide range of disciplines, including intelligence, creativity, personality, aptitude, and imagination. Professor Jung is the editor of the Cambridge Handbook of the Neuroscience of Creativity, and his work has been featured on CNN, BBC, The New York Times, The Atlantic, and National Geographic. It is an honor to have you here with us. Thank you very much, Karen. That is a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, national treasure, it sounds like. Uh, so now you get a Freudian psychiatrist followed by a Jungian uh, psychologist. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, that the uh, transition isn't uh, particularly glaring. And my approach, um, you don't know much about me as you do about your first speaker. Uh, so I am a professor of neurosurgery, but they don't let me near the knives. So it's very important that you know that. Uh, I am a neuropsychologist. I work with a neurosurgeon during awake craniotomies, uh, which sounds rather horrifying. We wake patients up uh, to remove tumors uh, near eloquent areas during surgery. If you're interested in this procedure, I've written a story in the current issue of Psychology Today called Unwavering Faith about one such patient that you can uh, read a blog post about this experience. It's a fascinating uh, procedure and it really, I think, culminates my work in individual differences. I've studied, as, as uh, Karen was saying, intelligence, creativity, personality, all of these different functions of individual differences. And uh, these individual patients during surgery really get at the heart of individual differences. Uh, your first speaker uh, talked about the homunculus, this, this little man in the brain that uh, controls motor behavior, for example. And it differs from person to person. And we have to open up the brain and actually map that out from person to person because the face area might be slightly different in you as compared to you. And we have to understand where the face area is and the hand area is and how that relates to where the tumor might be. So these nice maps of the brain are nice in theory and academics will talk to you about the brain in theory and I think that's where some of the disconnect is between neuroscientists and educators is a lot of what happens theoretically doesn't translate to the classroom. And um, I think that's a big problem. We can do all these studies in rodents, in college students mostly, but it really doesn't uh, translate uh, to the classroom. So uh, I, I really have a more cautious approach about what neuroscientists can offer uh, to educators. And, and you'll see at the end, uh, my message is, is quite a bit similar to your first speaker. Uh, play is enormously important. Um, so with that, let's begin. So this is the organization of my talk. Um, I want to take you, I've been studying creativity for close to 10 years, and I want to take you a bit on that journey that I've been on for the last 10 years. Um, and this creativity thing is rather monolithic. Uh, it, it, it is a singular construct that we talk about, but uh, can it be separated out into different parts or pieces that are amenable to to understanding or to even to research. So we can talk about creativity in the abstract, but is it something that we can actually research? Is it actually something that we can uh, encourage or inculcate uh, in our students? Uh, so we have to understand the different parts of creativity. And one of the first people that tried to understand creativity was Henri Poincaré, a famous genius, a mathematician, philosopher, and he tried to look at his own thinking in, in his creative process. He looked into his own mind and he tried to separate out the different aspects of creativity. And this is really held up quite well in the creativity research. We, we understand that it's broken into these different parts, preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. That, that, that creativity isn't just come all together into one piece there has to be these different elements that come together in order for people to be truly creative as opposed to just productive. 
So I want to take you through a little bit of these uh, different parts because they are important in thinking about trying to uh, achieve more creative students, if you will. So preparation is the first part. And, and I think Malcolm Gladwell was uh, one of the uh, popularizers of uh, this type of term, this 10-year rule or 10,000 hours, that it takes uh, a long amount of time to become creative. You have to have information as an input in order to have an output that is creative. You have to put things in your brain in order to have creativity as an output. Uh, so the artist needs to understand color and hue and tone and the, uh, the writer has to understand sentence structure, for example, and has to understand metaphor, simile, analogy, and the difference between those, those things um, in order to be able to be a good writer. So this 10-year rule or 10,000-hour rule is a pretty good rubric, rubric for understanding preparation. And of course, this varies among individuals. Some people can take longer than 10 years. Uh, some people take far shorter. But about 10 years is, is the amount of time that it takes to put all that information in your head in order to be creative. You have to have those inputs in order to be creative. Incubation is that time away from that creative part where you let ideas percolate uh, in your head, where ideas run into each other that otherwise wouldn't have run into each other. So this is purportedly a picture of Beethoven. I don't know how they would have taken a picture of Beethoven back in the 1800s, but uh, Beethoven on one of his long walks. Uh, and so you have uh, different methods that people use to incubate. Uh, some people take a warm bath. Uh, some people take a long walk. Uh, I like to mow the lawn. It's a kind of a ridiculous activity. It's a repetitive activity. Uh, that allows me to think about things while I'm doing something with my body uh, that is repetitive. Um, but people have different techniques, and one size doesn't fit all in the education realm when you're thinking about how do I do this incubation thing. Some children might have uh, a need time away where they're just by themselves. Some might incubate better in groups. Uh, there is not a one size fits all for this incubation thing. But incubation is an important part of the creative process where you're al allowing these ideas to run into each other that otherwise would not. These bits and pieces of information. Yoan Kennett, we were talking about earlier, is uh, expert in this uh, research where you're looking at different ideas that can uh, merge, uh, different words, for example, that are related to each other. And Yoan can look at the, the uh, relatedness to different words, a researcher from this university. He can look at the, the uh, distance between different words and how related they are to each other and how people are adept at pulling far words as opposed to near words to each other in using or pulling their creative ideas together. It's very fascinating technology to see how ideas, semantic relationships, are pulled together in, uh, in language. And it gives you an access into how the brain pulls ideas together uh, in terms of networks that might be, might be uh, pulled together for uh, creativity. Now, there's other ways to incubate. Uh, a famous story about uh, Hemingway is that uh, he wrote drunk and edited sober. Uh, so <laughs> there, 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 there are a lot of different ways that people go about doing this incubation thing. And this just gets, a, gets at uh, one of those. Uh, I, I don't uh, recommend this for your students, by the way. So. <laughs> Illumination, that flash of insight, uh, the aha moment, the spark uh, that comes when a creative idea has been incubating for a while. Um, I don't think that this is particularly critical uh, for the creative process. Some researchers really put a lot of emphasis in that aha moment, the spark of insight. I have rarely had sparks of insight, so maybe that's perhaps why I don't put much uh, credence to this. It seems like, for me, a lot of incubation, a lot of hard work, and then an idea slowly emerges over time. It doesn't just pop into my head uh, in a dream or something like that. But people do report that this aha moment or flash of insight is a part of their creative process. Archimedes uh, 
uh, cries Eureka when he figures out how to measure the amount of gold in a crown by submerging it in a bathtub, just as he, he is submerged in a bathtub and displacing water. Uh, this flash of insight can be a, a part of the creative process. And something that people often forget is verification. You have to check to see if your idea will work out in the world. Is it plausible? Will people like it? Uh, is it something that is going to fit in enough with existing technology or existing ideas that won't tumble the uh, established paradigm? Sometimes paradigm tipping is important, but that check, uh, that verification to see if it is plausible, if it's not just crazy ideas, uh, is particularly important. And these different aspects of creative cognition have been disentangled from uh, each other. The preparation, the um, uh, um, incubation, the illumination, and the verification. Different researchers, uh, including Dr. Faust, have, uh, have uh, disentangled these from one another to try to understand which aspects of creative cognition are important to that pulling together of the whole aspect of creativity. So, the number of neuroscientific studies of creativity has exploded in the last decade. I happen to be lucky enough to get on the bandwagon uh, just at the right time. I don't know where the red, yeah, there it is. I got into the business just about right here when it really started to take off and I was very lucky. Dr. Faust again has been at this a long time and was one of the researchers that I looked to to provide a framework for the research that I was doing using techniques, uh, mostly structural techniques. Uh, so Dr. Faust has done functional uh, work, other people have done EEG work, uh, fMRI. I was using mostly structural brain imaging techniques which I'll talk to you about in a bit. Um, I think structural techniques looking at the brain are interesting. <clears throat> Functional techniques allow you to look at the brain as it is working. EEG allows you to see electrical activity while the brain is working. fMRI allows you to see blood flowing around as the brain is working. And it gives you a good idea of brain states. I think that structural imaging techniques give you a good idea about brain traits. So the information that has been written into the brain over longer periods of time. How are people using their brain over longer periods of time that changes the very structure of their brain? So their brain might have been built that way from the start through genetics, or it might have uh, evolved or changed over time by uh, facilitated use. And this is still an open question in creativity research. And one of the reasons that I got into creativity research, because I think there's a lot more plasticity with regard to creativity than there is in things like intelligence and personality uh, and even aptitude. I think those things are much more under genetic um, <coughs> determinism as opposed to uh, uh, environmental uh, manipulation. So when I, I came to creativity research, with much more enthusiasm for the likelihood of being able to manipulate uh, creativity through external uh, environmental influences. But you can see there's been an explosion of creativity research with um, whole centers being created here uh, in uh, Israel, in Germany, in the United States, in Australia, there's in China, there's whole centers that now are dedicated to the study of creativity and very happy and gratified to see that. So I want to talk a little bit about evolution and creativity. This is a bit off the beaten path, but I think that there, and one of the kind of uh, hobby horses of mine is that there are two main reasoning systems that are dedicated to our survival. Um, Cosmides and Tubi talked about uh, evolution of creativity in the brain. Every, uh, and I'm just going to read this to you. I know you can read, but it's probably a little hard to read. Elsewhere, we have written at length about the trade-offs between problem-solving power and specialization. General purpose problem solving architectures are very weak but broad in application, whereas special purpose problem solving designs are very efficient and inferentially powerful but limited in their domain of application. I think that Cosmides and Tubis are talking about the differentiation between something like intelligence and something like creativity. Intelligence 
is something that is a general purpose cognitive system that is weak, but it is very broad in its scope. It can be applied to a lot of different uh, systems in your problem solving day from figuring out what you're going to wear to work to how you're going to get to work to some very uh, um, important problem at work. These dedicated uh, or these uh, very weak problem solving <coughs> systems are something that you face on a day to day basis. And this is my model for that general weak problem solving system. Some of you have seen that in Israel, that's good. Um, this weak problem solving system um, requires some general sense of brain structure and function in order to get there. But you have to have a situation specific improvisation. There's going to be problems that you have not encountered in your day to day life. There's a, a flood on your way home from work. A relationship goes sour. You have to figure out how to solve problems in your day-to-day -day life on a very low frequency basis. It doesn't take general purpose problem solving to do that. It takes very situation specific improvisation. That sounds more like creativity. And one example that I have of this is not human. We have dolphins, we have apes. This, this dolphin has figured out and they're just female bottlenose dolphins in Shark Bay in Australia that have figured out that if they put a sponge on the end of their nose, they can whisk it around on the bottom of the bay and fish will rise out of the uh, bottom of the bay and they will drop the sponge and eat the fish. <laughs> this is a tool use in dolphins, a very situation specific improvisation that allows them to protect their very sensitive beaks. Um, this is a situation specific improvisation of tool use in dolphins. Um, so humans are not uh, alone in this improvisation, but it's rather unique problem solving capability that has allowed us the internet, it has allowed us modern technology, it has allowed us to uh, explode in terms of our technological advance in the last hundred years. So I think we can look for creativity in other creatures, but I think creativity is something that certainly defines us as uh, uh, technologically and intellectually advanced in terms of our problem solving. So where is it? The uh, answer is we really don't know where creativity is in your brain, um, but we know that networks help. And uh, Yoed and other people, uh, Roger Beatty, have really helped us to understand how networks in the brain uh, help us to understand creativity. I'm gonna, uh, walk you through that a little bit. And that depends also on what it is. And we really have some horrible measures of creativity, which I'll walk you through um, to show you how poor. Some of you educators might know uh, how poor these measures are uh, because you've used them in the Florence test of creative thinking, perhaps, or, um, uh, well, I'll walk you through some of them, but uh, the Mednick tests. Um, so these tests are particularly bad, and I would invite any of you to please invent new tests of creativity, more tests of, better, more creative tests of creativity, because these are particularly horrible. So this one uh, might not work with uh, an Israeli audience, but a lot of you speak English. So this one is uh, um, the remote associations test. And th the idea of this test is you're provided with three words, lick, mind and shaker, and you're to think of one word that binds them all together uh, into compound words. <coughs> any of you have an idea what it is? Salt. salt, right. Salt lick, salt mine, salt shaker. That is the word that just springs into your mind. This is the test of insight in cognitive neuroscience. How crappy is that? <laughs> this. This semantic test, this verbal, predominantly verbal test, is the test of insight uh, in cognitive neuroscience. It is really a sad state of affairs. We still use this brick test. Tell me as many different ways you can think of to use a brick. Have you heard of that? Yeah. To build a house, uh, to hit my brother with, uh, to make a mock coffin at a Barbie funeral. Well, that last one's a bit different. I don't know if it's creative, but uh, uh, we, we have devised techniques to uh, evaluate these uh, verbal outputs to see if they're more or less creative using the consensual assessment technique. But we're still using these uh, very dated tests uh, to look at creative cognition. 
uh, the Mednick type of test, uh, figuring out the, the shortest distance or removing uh, one matchstick and seeing how many different uh, blocks you have left. Uh, we have uh, uh, fMRI designs that are kind of clever where you're looking at different uses of a pen. And then we have the Rorschach test, the old uh, Herman Rorschach test, uh, which I learned in clinical psychology as a projective technique, but people are using that to uh, look at uh, creativity. You know, uh, so the Rorschach is classically, uh, what, what might this be? So what, 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 what comes to your mind when you see a, a blot like this? I can't hear you, what? A butterfly, yes. A vampire, okay. Psychologist. A psychologist, <laughs> that's probably the best answer. <laughs> that's probably the best answer I've heard. Um, so, uh, you know, Gene Simmons from KISS is what I think of, which is a bit off the beaten path. But butterfly, bat, uh, these are common responses that you get from the Rorschach. Um, these are normal responses, these are average responses. So the, the more weird responses, like uh, psychologists will talk to you after the talk, <laughs> <laughs> might be, might be uh, more creative, they might uh, signify something else. But these are the types of tests that we're using for uh, creative cognition. Now this is a, te this is a picture of my brain uh, rotating. Uh, uh, the previous speaker showed you a, a um, there you go. The previous speaker showed you some of these static images of MRIs. What we can do is we can extract those uh, static MRI pictures and we can reconstruct those into three-dimensional MRI images. I don't know. There we go. And we can look at the cortical surface. I don't know if I can. There we go. We can reconfigure those and measure the cortical surface area, the thickness at each individual gyrus of this brain. So this is my brain. It looks similar to your brains, uh, but these different thicknesses and, and surface areas and volumes are going to differ from person to person to person. Remember when I said at the beginning of the talk that in neurosurgery, the location of my homunculus might be slightly different, the location or size of Broca's area which uh, controls expressive language, or Wernicke's area, which controls receptive language, might be slightly different in my brain compared to your brain. So we have to understand that. And those slight differences can be related to things like creativity. So this is one of the structural techniques. Some of it might be genetic. Some of it is certainly environmental uh, and use dependent that we can extract, measure, and that allows us to do science. This is really an important uh, that we can look at the differences in surface area from brain area to brain <coughs> area, compare it from person to person, average that together, and ask questions like, where in the brain does cortical thickness relate to creative cognition? So the first study that we did asked just that question. We asked, where in the brain does cortical thickness relate to creative achievement and relate to divergent <coughs> thinking. So the divergent thinking was this, the divergent thinking was this, uh, these crappy measures of uh, divergent thinking, tell me as many ways you can think of to uh, use a brick. And then creative achievement was Carson's creative achievement questionnaire, which was in common usage, which uh, looks at 10 different domains, writing, uh, architecture, scientific creativity, and asks college students, admittedly, how creative they are in each of these domains. And we found a very interesting finding. We found that one particular area of the brain in the orbital frontal cortex was significantly predictive or correlated with creative achievement. And that area in the orbital frontal cortex was blue. Usually you see these things colored in red because higher activity is related to higher creativity. But this is, is colored in blue because lower cortical thickness was related to increased creative <laughs> achievement, uh, which was puzzling. This is one of the first studies we did in 2009, I believe, uh, in human brain mapping. So we had to interpret this. And we interpret this as a, the frontal lobes are basically involved in keeping you out of trouble, 
look before you leap, the, the inhibitory capacity. Uh, males have frontal lobes too, just as the uh, first speaker said. We, we do have frontal lobes, we occasionally use them. And, and that inhibitory capacity, the ability to keep you out of trouble, is a very important uh, capability of human frontal lobes, inhibitory capacity. So we interpreted this as disinhibitory mechanisms associated with a broader spread or activation of creative cognition leading to higher creative achievement. Our second study looked at white matter functioning. So this again is my brain, and this is the white matter, the wires that connect up the different thinking parts of the brain. So this is an important technique because uh, the cortical mantle, the cellular neurons, are the thinking parts, but how they're connected to each other is also particularly important. So we can articulate, as you can see, different regions, looking at how they're connected locally and how they're connected globally. This is the white matter that connects up uh, the two hemispheres. You can see the corpus callosum being articulated right here from left hemisphere to right hemisphere. Uh, so this uh, wiring of my brain can be captured in real time. So we did this with all our patients and we asked again a very simple question. Where in the brain is creativity related to the wiring of the brain? And again, we found some very interesting results, particularly that the results were inverse, that higher creativity was related to lower white matter fidelity. Now these are normal college students. College students, well, to the extent that college students can be normal, uh, these were normal college students. They were healthy college students. They didn't have any diseases or disorders. Uh, we screened all those out. But the, the white matter fidelity was lower, meaning that there were either less myelination in the white matter or more crossing fibers leading uh, from one direction to the other. So we interpreted this as, again, a disinhibitory type of capability leading to higher creative cognition. When we started to look at all the literature, we noticed a pattern that not just in our lab, but in many labs, there were these inverse relationships that were being found. Uh, you, were fi whoop, you were finding, whoa, went way ahead. There we go. Push this button. That you were finding this inverse pattern found. In disease, in frontal temporal <coughs> dementia, you are finding decreased temporal lobe uh, capabilities or decreased temporal lobe structural <coughs> integrity being associated with increased artistic uh, ability. Anna Abraham was doing some incredible studies uh, showing decreased uh, structure in stroke patients and traumatic brain injury patients. There were a few studies showing positive uh, uh, correlations. But the pattern was, was striking. And a study by um, Charles Lim really did it for me. He was doing a study of improvisational musicians where he was looking at their performance when they copied music as opposed to when they improvised. And when they improvised, you really saw a quieting of the outside shell of the brain and an awakening of the inside shell of the brain. This corresponds to two different networks of the brain called the cognitive control network and the default mode network. And you'll notice that the middle parts of the brain are predominantly blue and the outside parts of the brain are predominantly red. And I'll walk you through that. So in our studies, the default mode network resides in these medial parts of the brain in blue here. And you'll notice in the medial parts of the brain there's a predominance of blue areas where inverse relationships are associated with higher creativity. And you'll see the default mode network is medial prefrontal cortex, medial orbital frontal cortex, parts of the parietal lobe, and parts of the medial temporal lobe are involved in the default mode network. And these regions overlap significantly uh, in creative cognition. And this was the first time this had been articulated. Whereas in other research, in our intelligence research, we notice that the cognitive control network overlaps significantly with regions associated with intelligence. So this gets back to this evolutionary capability that I was talking about earlier, that I think there are two reasoning networks 
that are working in our brain. We have that intelligence network, certainly, that is highly adaptive, highly uh, indicative of general problem-solving behavior. It's weak, but it's general and it's problem-solving. But we need to have that, that situation-specific improvisation in order for us to do some of those low resolution problems that come up in our life. Children need that too. So, what does it mean for you? With internal thought, that, that default mode network is involved in thinking about your own problems, thinking about time travel, thinking about your relationships. It's that internal <coughs> mental simulation. And how can we do that if we're still stuffing information into our brains? So part of the mission, I guess, if I had any mission about what educators can do to facilitate is that to find your away time. Uh, a warm bath, drinking, again, I'm not uh, advising this for your, uh, for your class. Meditation, long walks, exercise, napping, and the most important thing, recess. Um, that's the most important time I remember from my childhood is the time I got away uh, from the classroom and I could try out ideas, try and fail, try and succeed, um, and no I anything. The, the iPhones, the iPads, that information that you're still pushing into your brain is a distraction and I think that is really critical uh, to the loss of creative cognition. The external thought selection process is being open to new experience. Um, travel is important to that, reading, getting out of your bubble, being critical and rational. These are all characteristics of that uh, open to experience uh, capability that is highly correlated with creativity. Grit and persistence is extremely critical to creativity. Uh, teaching children to be uh, sensitive to criticism, uh, but being able to take criticism. I can tell you with all of my research projects, none of them have been accepted on the first time. I've always had to resubmit and revise. It's always been about the failures of your research before you uh, eventually get something uh, accepted. And finally, put out a lot of ideas. This is the most critical aspect of creativity. Uh, it's been shown that if you put out more ideas, one of them is most likely to hit. So with that, I would like to take your questions. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>